in Cairns going to check out the Tank Museum. Let's see what it's like. Oh, look at this. Tank Lover's Paradise. T-54, it's a Chefton. Whole collection of various tanks and assault guns. We've got artillery over this side. Amazing. T2, really low profile. Amazing looking tank. We have the M113, also known as the Bucket. I've taken a lot of rides in these things. Very uncomfortable. Um, armored personnel carrier for carrying soldiers um, into combat. Just when I got out of the army, they were going through a big upgrade for the buckets. Uncomfortable seating. Remember having to sit in one of these things with my SLR between my legs. You had the gunner standing there, who was usually the commander from memory. And there's the driver's position at the front. This beast here is a Sturmgeschutz, which is a infantry support tank destroyer from World War II, German. Um, this has a lot of significance to me because my grandfather served in the German army in World War II and he was in one of these, a Sturmgeschutz. Not sure which variant, might have been this one, might have been the Stug III. Yeah, these were a very successful tank destroyer. I think they destroyed more tanks during the war than anything else. They're not actually a tank as such. But, uh, but a chassis with a fixed mounted gun. Um, and they'd, my grandfather used to describe how they would park behind railway lines and things like that and lay in ambush and just destroy tanks as they were moving forward. And towards the end of the war, they actually, they ran out of parts, they ran out of fuel and they were, weren't be able to do much with them. So they just used them as field guns. So they would be towed to their pre-prepared positions and they'd engage the enemy and then hopefully not get killed and then get towed out afterwards as they were running out of resources towards the end of the war. So I think my grandfather was actually really lucky that he survived the war. I'm glad he did, because if he didn't, I wouldn't exist. Um, but uh, yeah, bit of family history there. So it's a very low profile tank. Upa said it was revolutionary for its time because it was so low. Um, it was a very hard tank to take out. I shouldn't call it a tank, it's a tank destroyer. As you see, no traversable turret. Elaborate camouflage pattern. Well, it was a it was a loader and then a gunner from what I understand. So he would have been sitting just up here under all that armor, sighting and firing the gun. The tank's covered in this uh, strange material. I think that was to stop magnetic mines sticking to the armor, make it harder for them to take out by infantry at close range. Stug 3. So, yeah, the Stugs um, collectively took out around 20,000 tanks. So, yeah, the most deadly, most deadly armored vehicle ever made. A couple of spare, uh, spare wheels on the back. I know they often strap logs to the side of them as well. British Valentine, they use these in Operation Crusader and various other battles, again in African colours, used by the British. So I had a grandpa that served in a Sturmgeschütz uh, in the German army, World War II, but I also had another one on the other side, um, serving in the North African campaign, fighting for the Allies. So I had a grandfather that was at Tobruk, and he would have been alongside vehicles like this. So, yeah. <laughs> Interesting times. Yeah, I don't think uh, my two grandfathers would have ever met. I don't think they were in different different areas, but yeah, I had family on both sides of World War II. <laughs> Looks like a tourist armoured personnel carrier. <laughs> Just talking to Aki about the colours of the different tanks. They're actually colour-coded to the environment they're designed to operate in. So yeah, these yellow ones are built for the desert because they want to camouflage against the desert so people can't see them. These darker ones from operating in forests and, and green wooded areas. You can see the Australian camouflage pattern over there matches the Australian bush. So yeah, they sort of colour the, the tanks. 
for their environment to make them harder to spot and therefore harder to destroy and better at doing ambushes. British recon tanks are such cool looking things. I always loved them. Used to have pictures of them when I was a kid. Nice oh, front sloping shape and then a rear mounted turret. Spectacular looking things. Out this monstrous tank, the Churchill. Absolute beast of a tank. I don't even think I could reach that turret. Not quite. Huge tank. Here we got the Tiger One. A very, very impressive piece of tank. This thing is huge. Again, so tall I can't reach the barrel. These things were absolutely deadly in World War II, but the Germans didn't build too many of them, thankfully. Otherwise, uh, things might have been a lot harder for the uh, for the Russians and for the uh, Allied troops landing at D-Day. A very, very impressive and deadly piece of kit. This particular one is a replica uh, from the movie Fury. Because they're not very common, the old Tigers. They didn't build too many of them, and a lot of them got destroyed, obviously, because they got well used in the war. Yeah, they were, they were a very deadly piece of kit. That massive armament on them would take out pretty much anything in one shot and uh, and they're almost invulnerable because of the strength of the armor on them. This is the actual turret of a tiger tank. Too bad the rest of the tank isn't there but it looks very very much like the replica back there so I think the replica got it pretty right. And here we have the panther. Would have been an exceptionally good tank, except from what I understand, it had a very unreliable drivetrain that tended to break, so they had to drive it very carefully so they wouldn't, wouldn't bust its drivetrain. Aside from that, it's reported to be one of the best tanks of World War II. Panzer IV. Good tank at the start of the war, but totally out of date, as all the bigger tanks sort of came into service later on upgraded panzer that the Germans used. So as you can see, lots of extra stuff strapped on it. You've got plates to try and detonate rounds um, before they actually hit the actual armour of the tank, around the turret and on the sides as well. And a uh, much bigger gun in there to take out the heavier armour, which occurred later in the war. Some stuff in here. This is a German half-track in desert colours. Must have been used in Africa. the absolutely deadly German 88 flat gun which ended up as far as I understand being used as a anti-tank gun because it was so big and so effective although it was originally designed to point up it actually pointed pointed uh, horizontally just as well this one looks like it's got eight tank kills marked up on its armor nasty piece of kit We have a half track uh, with snow cam on it. Hands are four in Africa colours. And another variant of the Panzer four. Hmm. Here we go, the Soviet T-34. Nemesis of the German army destroyed their tank formations on the Eastern Front. Bet my opa didn't like these things very much. Designed to be mass produced. That was its main advantage over the German tanks. The Russians could pump out a lot of them very quickly and the Germans just simply couldn't do that. And it was quite a good tank too. Weird ass oddball of a tank. This is the Grant. Actually saw a lot of service, I think in Africa, uh, against uh, against the German army. Rommel didn't do very well. Tended to get cleaned up by the by the Panzers, but uh, I'm sure it certainly helped. Not a lot of room in there. Looks like the gunners needed to be a midget. The driver in there looks like he's got more room in the command. Commander sits in there and he's got plenty of space. Yeah, might need a midget gunner inside one of these things. There we go. If 
if you're interested in armour or in artillery, come and check out the uh, Armour and Artillery Museum in Cairns. A lot of really interesting toys here. Too bad they're, uh, they're used for killing people. If you enjoy this kind of positive adventure content, please like, subscribe, and check out a few of these other adventures.